Most Americans are still going about life, investing, and retirement planning as if nothing unusual has happened to our financial system. And few seem to realize the repercussions of the $11 trillion that's been pumped into the U.S. financial system over the past 18 months. At least four billionaires have stated publicly that Americans aren't paying enough attention to this development. And now, a former Goldman Sachs banker says sooner than most people think, millions of Americans will potentially be pushed out of the middle class, out of private retirement, and out of a decent life and into a collectivist nightmare he calls financial lockdown. Find out how to protect yourself, your money, and your family with a free copy of this new report. In it, he'll show you the four steps he recommends you take immediately. Simply go to 2022wakeup.com to get your free copy. Again, that's 2022wakeup.com for a free copy of this new report. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is April 14th. It's a Thursday, 2022. We got some breaking news for you. Coming out this morning, I woke up to the news that Elon Musk has proposed to buy Twitter. Not 9% of the owns, but 100% and take it private. We'll talk about that and the implications that could have throughout the entire market. We're going to talk about the markets. We got a bit of a rally yesterday. We'll see if we get any follow through here today. We're doing a very early show because we got some special stuff going on this afternoon. We're going to talk about Bitcoin. We're going to talk about inflation. How possibly, if you think inflation continues, you want to invest to hedge your portfolio. And then something I used to do all the time doing it today, we're taking your questions from Twitter. So we're on there right now, taking questions live. We'll answer them. All this and more coming up right now on Making Money. Again, welcome everybody. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 14th of April, 2022. It is a beautiful Thursday here in Baltimore, Maryland, inside the home studios. As I mentioned, the breaking news, I don't care what you turn on, anything financial, yahoo.com, any, any website's going to have the headline of Elon Musk offers to buy Twitter for $43 billion. That's around $54 a share. He wants to turn it into a private company. So let me just pull up here real quick and I'm going to show you that we're, we're taping this show right now about 8.45 Eastern time in the morning. We had some stuff going on in, in the office later today, so we had to tape it early. Here's a chart of Twitter. Let's take a look at what it's doing here this morning. You can see it's trading at 48.81, let's call it. Um, so it's not up that big really from where it closed yesterday and the offer price is 54, which it did at some point this morning hit that 54 level. And if you take a look at where Twitter is now versus before Elon Musk made the announcement he's buying 9%, you can see Twitter is around $39 a share before that. And according to him, he started buying shares back in the mid 30s. So it's up quite a bit from there, from the $54 range. However, look where Twitter was just last July, up in the 70s. It was above 80 a little over a year ago in February. So buying at 54 seems like a hell of a deal, if you ask me, if, if he can get it for this price. And I'm going to show you a long-term chart of Twitter, just to give you an idea of what the stock has gone over the years. I mean, it was back at $54 in 2015. Got close to there again in 2018 before the rally that we saw 2020. A lot of this you know, had to do with Trump being on there and, and just a lot of people getting on Twitter at that time, um, you know, or anti-Trump, whatever you want to do, what are we going to call it? But more people being uh, uh, on Twitter and social media, pandemic going on, more people staying at home online, that type of stuff. Uh, so this is where we stand with Twitter right now. You know, I'll give you my thoughts. And um, my thoughts are that this is going to be a drawn out mess um, for several reasons. One, there's going to be pushback from, I think, people at Twitter, large shareholders that don't want Elon Musk to get a hold of it because it is such a powerful platform. Elon Musk, uh, from what he says, he wants to transform this as a private company, meaning if he buys it, uh, if you own Twitter shares, let's say the deal goes through. I don't think it goes through at this price uh, at, at all, $54 a share. You get the $54 a share and you're done. Twitter doesn't trade anymore. It's a private company. I don't think that happens. I think a lot, there's a lot of ways that can, this can go and it's still early. So I haven't really been able to dive into exactly what's going to happen. And I'll keep you up to date of what I think is going to happen. Um, there could be a, a situation too where he pulls out and says, no, I, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm selling my 9%. Because he, he, he alluded to um, in, in a statement that he said that 
that he, you know, he believes he can transform, you know, basically the, the free speech of this country, but also said um, that if he does not have a chance to buy it, uh, that it, essentially he may sell all his shares. So this 9% that he bought in, that, that was announced just two weeks ago, was basically the shot across the bow, basically saying, hey, I'm here, uh, but if he cannot get this, I truly believe that he will most likely pull back. And the, his exact words were this in, in the letter that he wrote, my offer is my best and final offer. And if it is not accepted, I would need to reconsider my position as a shareholder. Twitter has extraordinary potential. I will unlock it, Elon Musk. That was the very end of it. And as I mentioned, he's offering 54, it's actually $54.20 to buy 100% of Twitter. And as he said, it's a 54% premium over the day that he began investing in Twitter and 38% premium over the day before his investment was announced to the public. So it, it's, uh, again, this is, this is a very fresh story, a uh, very uh, fluid story at this point. I haven't seen much come back from uh, Dorsey, Jack Dorsey, of course, founder of Twitter, and a lot of other people. I haven't seen their comments as of yet. Um, I'm sure there's a lot going on behind the scenes right now. Uh, again, Twitter stocks up a little bit, but not at that $54 uh, price. I'm going to give you just my very quick thoughts, and this is without really thinking it through and doing deep research. Uh, this is waking up, uh, seeing the news, showering, coming in here and getting ready to go put on a suit and do a bunch of stuff today. I think it could go a couple ways. I think Elon Musk could eventually get it, but I think if he does, it's going to be at a higher price. So I think it's going to be closer to 60 or so. Even though he says it's his final offer, he says a lot of things. Uh, he's a bit of a negotiator. So he always, you know, this is my final offer. I'll walk away. I think if he gets it, it's going to be closer to 60. If he doesn't get it, um, he could, yes, sell all the shares he has, which is 9% of the company, which could send the stock back down to the mid-30s pretty easily. Um, trading here around 48, so that gives you about what? I, I think it goes at 60 if it goes. That's 12 bucks to the upside. If it falls, I think mid-30s, 12 to the downside. That's what you call a one-to-one -one, uh, risk to reward. So your risk is 12 to the downside, reward is 12 to the upside. That doesn't tell me uh, much about uh, where this goes. It, it kind of is a coin toss. And a coin toss is not a good investment. So to get down to what I'm trying to say here, the bottom line is I would not be buying Twitter stock here at 48 thinking, wow, it's a sure bet to go to 54. I'll make my six bucks. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. And if it does, I, I think it's going to take a very long time. But the upside is, is just likely as a downside, in my opinion. If he does take Twitter private. What does that mean for free speech in America? What does it mean for Twitter? I think it'd be huge for Twitter. I, I, I think this would be, uh, you know, obviously be a private company, so we wouldn't be able to invest in it. But I do think that it, it, it'd be good for Twitter and it would be good for the country because you can't pick and choose who you censor. And I, I know they're trying to do their best to censor false information, uh, but you can't censor opinions because my opinion might not be um, what the masses think, but it might be right. And a lot of times it is. And I'm not saying me personally, I'm just saying, you know, talking uh, that, in, that, in that manner. But my investing, if you follow me, I'm almost always a contrarian. I go against the markets. So if, if there was a Twitter that was just for the stock market, I know there's fin tweets and stuff, but I'm saying just for, for what I do. I'd probably be banned because I say things that are, that are that some people think are crazy, but a lot of times become true. No visionary follows the masses. I don't think we should be able to put people down and be rude and, and stuff like that. I get that. You know, you shouldn't be able to do that. But you should be able to have free speech. That's what America is about. So I think if, if he does take over Twitter, Twitter will become a, a force in, in, in the way that, that this country is molded going forward. So this, to me, is a game changer. This is a very pivotal point in this country. If Elon Musk can take this over, it is a very pivotal point. One other thing I want to mention, you have the SPAC, DWAC, which is planning on, on uh, merging with Truth, which is the um, Trump-backed uh, SPAC, Trump-backed social media uh, platform. It'd be interesting to see how that trades. It's trading down a, a few percentage points this morning, but if... Uh, Elon takes over Twitter, 
I don't know why you need truth because hopefully he lets free speech come through. So that's that's one to keep an eye on. If you're in that SPAC, uh, it's one definitely that, that I would keep an eye on. Okay. I could spend a whole show on this, but I don't want to spend a whole show on it. I'll, I'm going to cover this every show going forward and let you know what I think as long as there's news out there. So let's take a look at the markets here real quick. We'll take a look at the S&P 500. This is uh, pre-market. We're down about one-tenth of a percent, so not we're not having much movement here. We had a rally yesterday after a few days on the downside, uh, closed near the high of sessions. As I mentioned, we're kind of down just a little bit flat here, as you can see on the S&P 500. We're kind of in no man's land uh, in, in this range of the high that we saw in January and the low that we saw in February. We're right in the middle of the range, forming what you would call a triangle, uh, lower highs, higher lows. It probably breaks out at some point. I still think the path of least resistance right now is still up. Uh, but again, uh, I mentioned on Tuesday, I'd be a, a bit cautious as, as far as buying. I'm personally likely going to buy some stocks today, but they're in some crazy areas that uh, are not my typical uh, areas. Uh, and, and we'll talk about um, not some of those stocks, but we'll talk about some stocks out there that you may want to put on the watch list here uh, in just a moment. Uh, and then Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin has been moving all over the place and, uh, you know, had a bit of a pullback. So it broke below 40 grand. Now it's back up to 41.1. Again, that's kind of a no man's land too. And as I mentioned on Tuesday, over the last three months, the correlation between the NASDAQ 100, the QQQs, and Bitcoin is about 90%. So we're seeing, you know, that basically what they call risk on trades all moving in tandem. I hope that breaks at some point soon. I don't like to see things correlated because I want to have Bitcoin in my portfolio to diversify my portfolio and not track all the growth stocks that I have because that doesn't give me any diversification. When things are good, it's good. But when things are bad, it's bad. I like to be diversified. So hopefully that breaks at some point here in the near future. And just to mention real quick, uh, yesterday we had the PPI, the producer price index come in uh, at the highest level since they started keeping tracking that since 2010. Uh, and, th and that tracks the wholesale prices that the producers pay. And of course, the p higher prices they have, they pass along to consumers, which there was a prior day, it was a CPI, which I talked about last show, the consumer price index, both coming in very hot. We knew that, no big surprise. And after that came in hot yesterday morning, the market actually rallied. And a big reason I think that rallied is we're getting some clarity. We almost have it written in stone that the Fed's going to raise interest rates by 50 basis points in May and then the next meeting right after that. And that's why the yield on the 10-year fell down below 2.7% uh, yesterday as well. So give you an idea of, of, of why that's moving. So I'm going to take some questions. Before I jump into your questions, uh, I had quite a few questions on inflation. And um, I, I want to show you a, a chart of a uh, ETF. And I used to be a big proponent of ETFs. I don't think they're very good. Just like anything else, when something first starts out, it's really great. And then too many, I don't want to say bad actors, too many people that just aren't good at what they do get involved in the industry. And, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a conference going on right now, ETF Exchange down in Florida. My cousin's actually down there. He works for a, for a company in, in the business as well. And it's just, it's, it's become a joke. It's just a bunch of people patting each other on the backs, uh, saying how good they are and just trying to gather assets and not worrying about investors. I remember I used to go back to the ETF conference. It was called something different back then when it first started. Uh, I was in Amsterdam with the guys who founded it. We, we were there twice uh, speaking in the European one. Uh, I've been in Florida one. I was a speaker in one of the first, the first three they've ever done. And it was good back then because we were actually trying to share ideas and help people. Now it's just a bunch of schmoozing and, and spending money. But my point is I want to show you this ETF. It's the Inflation Beneficiaries ETF. It's symbol INFL. You've probably never heard of it, but you look at this chart. And what, what, what's amazing about this chart is uh, just look how strong it is. I mean, this is we know what the market's doing, but look at this. So this ETF has done very well. So what I want to do for you is, is take a look at some of the holdings as to why this is doing well and, and, and what is going on with this ETF. And maybe, again, I, I wouldn't say go buy the ETF and none of these stocks are buy or sell recommendations. I'm just sharing with some stocks in there that are doing well to give you an idea of what is performing. And if you believe inflation continues, Maybe these are the stocks you want to look at or competitors to these stocks. All right, let's take a look at number one here. This is uh, Archer Daniels Midland, ADM, farm products. You know, anything to do with farming and food and fertilizers have been doing great because of uh, higher prices in agricultural commodities, uh, because of what's going on in Ukraine, that's added to it, uh, because, uh, you know, Ukraine's kind of the breadbasket of the world, if you will. 
Um, you could see ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. Look at the run that this has had. I mean, it's very rare to see such a big run for ADM. Likely a pullback is continue is going to is going to be soon because it's so far above this red line, which is the 50-day moving average. I think we will see a bit of a pullback. That being said, I'm wrapping up uh, my next newsletter for Matt McCall's Mega Trade Investor, uh, which is a newsletter that we have here. And uh, my team and I we put together an awesome issue. It goes out on Monday. And uh, this issue is all about, it starts kind of with the conflict over Ukraine and Russia. It talks about the, a, a drought that's almost guaranteed that's going to continue uh, in uh, California. Really, they've been in a 22-year drought, one of the longest ever. But it's going to be worse this year because the snowpack that they check on April 1st, which is a very important day, is uh, the second lowest we've seen in the last 25 years, which means we're going to be fighting for water. Uh, we also have a bit of a drought in Kansas going on right now. Uh, there's other areas around the world that I, that I touch on. Uh, we have commodity prices going through the re roof. Wheat, corn, soybeans, you name it. Even cotton's going through the roof. Talk about that. Uh, we also talk about ammonia, uh, which is uh, huge in fertilizers, hitting a new all-time high. So there's a lot of stuff going on into scenes, which is why an Archer Daniels Midland is doing very, very well. And it's not necessarily about inflationary times, but it's doing well because of the type of inflationary period that we're in. So this ETF actually did a good job putting it in there. Uh, another one to take a look at is uh, TPL, which is uh, Texas Pacific Land Trust. And you know they own some land, uh, but it's also in, in areas of oil and gas. You can see that's, you know, it, had, it was in a downtrend for a while and it broke above it. But let me show you the long-term chart of this because there's something to be said about land. And you can see, you know, just going back to uh, 2015. So, you know, about, what, was that seven years ago now? It, it was around 142. This has been a 10x in seven years, owning land. Let's just say something. And going back to farmland, I read an amazing stat that's going to be in a newsletter that goes out Monday. I'm going to share the stat with you. Going back to 1990, farmland in the United States has never had a down year. Never had a down year. The average annual gain is 12.2%. 12.2%. The average annual gain of the S&P in that time is about 9%. So it's beating it by about a third. This is owning just land. And it has very low correlation, folks, to the S&P 500. So it instantly diversifies your portfolio. And I mentioned two farmland stocks that I like in the newsletter for my subscribers that goes out Monday. So if you're a, a mega trend investor, you'll be getting this on Monday after the close. And if you're not yet, please check us out. So Texas Land Holdings, uh, as you can see, Pacific Land Holdings, holding them very well. Uh, no surprise, another top holding in there is Viper Energy Partners. Uh, and this is a uh, an oil and gas midstream company. Again, look at the chart on this. Uh, there's some gold in there, Franco, Nevada, uh, which if I, I'm not a big fan of gold, if I had gold and gold stock, gold stock this is one of my favorites. Um, there's a couple um, exchanges in there. And when I say exchanges, I mean uh, like stock exchanges. This is the Intercontinental Exchange, uh, the ICE, the ICE, um, based out of Chicago. You know, when it comes to exchanges, a lot of exchanges do very well in times like this because there's still things changing hands. And when there's an exchange, you're just taking the middle. You're the middleman. It's good to be the middleman. Eventually, they'll be probably wiped out 10, 20 years from now as uh, decentralized finance, DeFi, takes over and gets rid of the middleman and takes away the money they're pulling from us every time we make a trade. You may not see it when you're buying in your Schwab account or anywhere else, but you're getting screwed out of pennies every time. So ICE is one of them. Uh, the ASX, which doesn't trade here, but it trades at the Australian Stock Exchange. Uh, the Bourse over in Germany is in this is in, is in here as well. Um, just a couple others. Bungie or Bungie, how you want to pronounce it? BG, which is a uh, another farm play. Uh, CBRE, you've probably heard of this. This is a real estate play. Um, this one's actually pulled back a little bit. Looks pretty damn good on that pullback. But my point is, it, it's, a, it's a very nice diversified uh, portfolio. It's got 27% materials, 27% financial services. A lot of those are REITs. 21% energy, 10% consumer defensive. So I, I'm not saying, again, go out and buy this, but you can build your own inflation hedges. And, and I'll talk more. Um, I, I've already talked in the last couple of shows of, of different ways to, to hedge inflation, but people keep asking about it. So I will uh, get to that more and more for you. But again, as a subscriber, I have some great inflation hedges coming out Monday after the close. All right, let's get to your questions. So I pulled these from Twitter this morning. One was about real estate, my view on real estate. And they mentioned a couple of real estate stocks. You know, real estate to me, 
I, I'll admit, I, I when it comes to the stock market, uh, investing for the long term, I'll be honest, I, it's something I'm good at, I excel at, it's something that's my passion, it's, it, there's nothing else in the world I'd like to be doing. Well, maybe owning an NFL team, that seems like a very good investment. But outside of that, uh, I, I love what I'm doing. When it comes to real estate, I've owned homes and condos and in, in, in various places in the country and even around the world. And a very uh, low win rate. Um, I'm trying to sell one in, in Baltimore right now in Baltimore City. And nobody wants to live in Baltimore City. And I can't blame them, honestly. Uh, but very tough to sell a nice condo in Baltimore City, get people to spend money. So I, I'm not an expert on that. I do see the industry changing dramatically. And uh, let's take a look at a couple of three of the stocks that, uh, that somebody asked about, four stocks. One is Porch Group, P-R-C-H. This was a SPAC that, that's really a play on, on the next generation of, of real estate, but everything SPAC's gotten crushed. So I, I'd avoid that here until it finds a bottom. Another one that was a SPAC, but it's, it's a much bigger company is Open Door Tech Technologies. This is one of Shamath's companies that came out. And again, I, I love uh, what they're doing here. And, and I think there's huge upside uh, with Open Door, but we could most likely we're going to see a slowdown in real estate because interest rates are going up, meaning mortgage rates are going up. But if I look at Open Door, it's about a $5.4 billion company. All right. Think about that. $5.4 billion company. It's revenue last year. This is real revenue booked was $8 billion. This year, they're looking for 17 Next year, 21 and a half. Again, it's only a $5 billion company. It's trading at 0.25 sales based on next year. Granted, still losing money, only 22 cents a share next year, so it's getting lower and lower. So it's losing money, so that's what's scaring people. But this is a company that is one of the, that I can consider the future of real estate, along with Redfin and Zillow. I don't want to get into all these. My point is, though, I think we will see a slowdown, and I don't know if I'd want to be a realtor right now. A good friend of mine in Florida is a realtor. Uh, my brother-in-law's family has been in, in, in real estate for decades and decades. Uh, they eventually sold to Warren Buffett's company still in it. And, and I always tell them, I, I think it's, it's, it's a business that I, I wouldn't be starting now. I would not want my kids or my niece or nephews. And I don't have kids if I had them to get in real estate. I just don't think uh, as a realtor, not real estate, realtor, uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult to make money. Somebody asked about fertilizers. Uh, I just talked about fertilizers already. I think the, with ammonia prices going through the roof, I think fertilizers are, are, are a great investment. And crops, like for example, corn crop is supposed to be 17% less this year versus last year. It may even be worse. Fertilizers help uh, obviously boost crops. So that's something we want to take a look at. Um, genomic stocks. Somebody asked about that. And I think genomics is, is, is something where it's often overlooked. It's often... Uh, viewed as something that's scary. Um, but let's, I'll, tell you, I'll show you an ETF here. This is the Global X Genomics and Biotech ETF. It struggled, but so has all of biotech. Um, I, I still believe that genomics, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which is part of genomics, is going to change the world. And I think by the end of the roaring 2020s, at the end of this decade, uh, there'll be several drugs and treatments that will be approved by the FDA that will cure diseases. We've seen it already in trials, people being cured of sickle cell disease, a, a horrific disease, painful, uh, early death, literally cured because there's one little uh, sell off that they can change. They go in and change that one gene, fix it, and you're cured. So I still have huge upside uh, for that. Somebody asked about semiconductors. You know, semiconductors, uh, I look at it in two ways. One, there's still supply chain issues. Uh, two, the economy is booming globally. I don't care what anybody says. Demand's high. And when you have high demand, you need semiconductors. So this is a chart of the SOX, the S-O-X-X. That's the iShares uh, ETF that tracks the uh, Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. And you can see it hit a high with the rest of the markets, pulled back since then. Uh, a lot of support down here. So if it holds here, I think this could be a good buy for a lot of semis uh, in this area. Somebody asked about solid state batteries. I've been writing about solid state batteries for many, many years. I still think there's huge upside in solid state batteries. Uh, batteries themselves are one of my favorite investments. Again, a lot of them have been beaten up, but there's no future of technology. There's no future of electric vehicles, no future of travel and space. Um, none of this stuff without batteries. So we need batteries and we need a next generation of batteries. Uh, somebody asked if we should be buying leaps. And, and what leaps are they? Are they're options that are, that are long out. So Let's say you're buying an option on, let's kind of make up the socks here, the, that this ETF uh, in January of 2024. And you know you buy it way out, you're buying a call on it, you buy a leap, you know, it's a way that you call that call and you let it go. And, and it's a, you put down less money, so it's a 
less expensive way to be leveraged to invest in that stock if you like it long term. Yeah, I mean, I like leaps, uh, but it's specific to each company, how they're priced. So there's a lot more to it, but I do like it. But I, but you have to be a little more educated on it, which I can't get into in the show right now. Uh, and the last question, somebody asked me about Lilium, L-I-L-M, which is one of the, as I call, flying car companies. And uh, Lilium, uh, you can see here is a SPAC, and then it pulled all the way back to two bucks, back to six. It's at 393 right now. I am actually flying in a week and a half. I booked a ticket last night to London, actually Coventry, which is about a few hours north of London, to a VIP tour. Don't worry, I'm going to get video and all kinds of stuff, interviews of the first, the world's first flying car airport. And it's it's amazing looking. I'm going to get a lot of good stuff, but um, I'm going to be there watching the, uh, the, the test flights, everything. I mean, I'm going to beg to get in one. I'm sure they won't let me, but through the VIP tour, I'm going to meet a lot of good people. I'm going to get some interviews, a lot of good video and footage here for you. Uh, but that's in a week and a half. I'll be flying over to London to, to do that for you. So uh, Lilium, I don't believe is involved in that at all. There's a lot of companies that are being involved in it. But what I love about this space, basically every major airline has invested billions, a total of billions into this. Some very, very wealthy people, some of the wealthiest people in the world are investing billions in this technology. Think about this. It looks like a drone with multiple propellers. It goes up and takes where you go and takes you down. A lot less infrastructure going on in the sky, folks. Uh, and, and as crazy as it sounds, and I've been saying this honestly for years, it's really crazy, it's, it's becoming more and more real. And people say, oh, it's like the Jetsons. It's different. And eventually, these are all self, self-flying. They're autonomous. They're run on batteries. Going back to batteries again, you need good batteries. Much safer than helicopters. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna change urban uh, transportation first, and then it'll eventually will branch out into the more regional. Um, you know, getting from here in Baltimore uh, up to Philly in 20 minutes versus sitting in traffic for two. It's gonna change the, how people fly, honestly. And of course, the first it's gonna be the wealthy, and then eventually, you know, it spreads to everybody else. But I'll be there in a week and a half, so about two weeks, you'll get the insight of what is really going on in this industry. But I'm going to stop it there because, like I said, I got to go put a suit on. We got a big day ahead of us here. We actually have our first really happy hour for the company here at Stansbury Research in a long time. It's amazing how many people come into the office when it's happy hour day. But I can't wait to see everybody uh, get out there and talk shop. As everybody knows, this is my passion. I love this stuff more than anything. I fell asleep last night on the couch with the with the charts up on my on, on my lap and uh, woke up to the uh, the charts in front of me. So again, thank you so much, everybody. I'll keep you up to date what's going on with Elon Musk. Right now, we have the market's down about 0.1% into the day. By the time you watch this, we'll see how we close. But I will be back Tuesday. Again, folks, we're here to have fun. We're here to get educated. And at the end of the day, we're all going to make some money. So thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.